growing up, I had a favorite TV show. It's called Lois and Clark. Clark is, of course, Superman. And my favorite superpower was his x-ray vision. Clark would take off his glasses and use his x-ray vision to see through walls, find the man in distress, and rescue him. Now, as a child, I always thought how cool it would be if I had this pair of extra vision goggles that I could use to find out exactly where my mom hid away all the cookies. <laughs> Today, in my research, I understand that x-ray is not only cool and it's not only a superpower in a TV show. X-ray is a very functional tool. We use x-ray in any airport when we get our backs checked for security. We use x-ray if we get injured and have to take an image of a fracture. X-ray is used in a variety of applications, in medicine, in research, in industry. Now, one reason that we still don't have our own pair of x-ray vision goggles is the fact that the devices that generate x-ray are quite big. Let's start with x-ray used in research. Well, in research, we use high-energy x-ray in order to reveal the structure of tiny proteins or see the most fundamental chemical reactions. Now, it seems that since x-ray devices were first designed for research, they only keep growing in size. For example, we could look at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Here we can find this facility where x-ray is being generated for research purposes. As you can see, the length of the entire facility is approximately two kilometers. And if we only consider the core component where the x-ray beam is generated, we're looking at more than 100 meters. So for research, we need strong, high-power x-ray beams and enormous facilities to generate them. However, these are not necessarily needed for x-ray applications in our daily lives. Say you had a really bad day. You fall down the stairs and you injure your arm then you have to get an x-ray image of the broken area so the doctor can see the fracture and take care of it. In order to do so, you have to go to a hospital and enter a room filled with equipment that has only one purpose, taking an image of a fracture. So instead of using, say, a simple camera to take a photo, you have to get in line, you have to wait, and enter a room filled with equipment just for one photo. So this is just very inconvenient. However, there are cases where the large x-ray devices are not only a cause of inconvenience, they can also be a cause of damage. 50% of cancer patients undergo radiation therapy. The patient lies in a bed under a one meter long treatment head where an x-ray beam is generated. The x-ray radiation is then projected as accurately as possible onto the patient's tumor. The radiation kills or hurts the cancerous cells. But just like killing cancerous cells, it can also hurt healthy cells. And as the x-ray source, the treatment head, is wide, so is the x-ray beam it generates. Therefore, the radiation may also reach the healthy tissue surrounding the tumor and damage it. We try to solve one problem, but we may create a new one. Now, imagine that all these x-ray applications could be done with a device in the size of your palm. Now, I know that in light of what I've showed you, this may sound like science fiction, right? But we have a great example for this kind of science fiction exactly. Going back to the 1930s, Alan Turing invented what we consider as the first computer. It was enormous, it was complicated, yet today, each and every one of you has his own smartphone. Such a small device that can do so much more than the first computer. Now, my question is how can we do the same, but for X-ray? In order to answer this question, we first need to understand how X-ray generation works today. Today, X-ray is generated using electrons. Electrons are tiny particles, which are a part of any atom in our body or the world around us. And the typical mechanism takes electrons and translates their energy into an X-ray beam. This process relies on three main stages. First, in order to get free electrons that we can manipulate, we use an electron gun. In the electron gun, a laser hits a metal and causes the metal to emit electrons. Next, these electrons need to gain energy that will later be translated into an X-ray beam. 
In order to do so, the electrons are accelerated to very high velocities. High velocity means high energy. The common accelerator relies on radio frequency acceleration. We have a designated structure that contains a force that changes in time and pushes electrons from one point to another until they gain enough velocity, enough energy. So at this point, after getting free energetic electrons, the third part is where the magic happens. The third part is called a wiggler. Why is it called a wiggler? Because it actually wiggles electrons. And as it turns out, when high energy electrons wiggle, they emit an X-ray beam. So for the wiggler, we have a series of magnet pairs. Each magnet in the pair has a different polarity, either north in red or south in blue. The force created in between these magnets is constant in time, but it changes from one point to another. It either goes up or down in each section of magnets. So, just like ringing a bell causes the clapper to swing from one side to another, energetic electrons injected into this magnet structure experience the changing force and swing up and then down and then up and then down again. The electrons wiggle inside the structure and emit an X-ray beam. Now the X-ray is being emitted from the electrons in the forward direction, just like being thrown of a fast moving car. And at this point, we can use the X-ray for the application we need. So now you may ask, why? Why so big? Why does this structure reach the length of meters or tens of meters like we saw for the research facilities? So the reason lies in the magnets. The physical size of each magnet is millimeters or centimeters long, which means every magnet period is one hundredth of a meter. And in order to reach enough X-ray radiation, we need many wiggling periods for the electrons. So the total length of the device, the sum of all the needed magnet periods, may reach the length of meters or tens of meters. So how can we take this device and make it smaller? The aim is to find a smaller source that can create a force strong enough to wiggle electrons. That's the mission occupying many scientists. One solution that I have worked on in my research was demonstrated over 40 years ago. The idea is that instead of using magnets to wiggle electrons, we can use a laser beam. Now a laser is a wave of light. So you can think of the laser as a wave in the ocean, and you can think of the electron as a tiny surfer. The tiny surfer rides the wave. It moves up and then down with it, which means it wiggles and emits an X-ray beam. So in this case, the wiggler is the laser instead of the magnets. The advantage of the laser is the fact that the wavelength or the period of the laser is one micrometer. One micrometer is one millionth of a meter. This means that the length of the period of the laser is three orders of magnitude smaller as compared to the period of the magnets, which was one hundredth of a meter. Now this means that we can have the same number of wiggling periods, but in a substantially shorter design. This means that the 100 meters that we saw for research facilities can one day become less than a meter. This means that the meter-long devices in hospitals can one day become the size of maybe a smartphone, a few centimeters or even less. This technology is not here yet, it's in progress. But maybe one day in the near future, we could be a little bit like Superman and have our own X-ray vision goggles or even use our smartphones to save lives, see through walls, or maybe just find those hidden cookies. Thank you.